Hello, everybody, and welcome to Hello Hump Day. And I hope that you are halfway to your goal for the week. Today, we are interviewing Miss Trish Carr, the fabulous Trish Carr. And I'm going to go ahead and read her uh, bio. She is an acclaimed sales expert for over three plus decades. Trish combines proven sales strategies with the latest behavioral science, resulting in a simple formula that gets past the pitfalls associated with selling. Man, we would all love to get past those pitfalls. <laughs> right? <laughs> she is a number one best selling author, business mentor, and award winning international speaker. Since her early years, she has worked to be the change by stepping up, speaking out, and leading the way on women's equality and human rights. She is the co-founder of Women's Prosperity Network, a global movement of women coming together in collaboration to be a massive force for positive change through our projects, our products, and our services. Welcome, Trish. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. I love talking about this subject. Yes. So I have known you for almost a year now, maybe a little over a year. Yeah. And I have always wondered, uh, I'm assuming you did not start where you are right now. No. And I'm curious, how did you start? Like, what was your journey of how you decided to even become self-employed? Well, that's a wonderful question. Let me tell you, I, um, I worked clerical jobs when I was younger, uh, right out of school. And uh, when I moved from New York to Florida, I wanted to get a job where I could be secure. And okay. I did. I landed the job of a lifetime. I got a job at the phone company. <laughs> and people who work for the phone company, just like people who work for the government, you don't need to get another job. You can move within that organization. You can transfer to other states. It was the perfect, great job. So that's least, why it was the job of a lifetime? It was. It was the job I wanted. I wanted to be able to have a corporate job that gave me opportunity for mobility. And that's what it did for me. Okay. Okay. And um, I really, you know, I don't know whether it was luck or preparation or the, the intersection of those two things, but I moved up the corporate ladder every couple of years. I changed job titles and job positions. So I never got bored doing what I was doing. And I and was you probably built your skill sets doing that too. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was so lucky that I was. I mean, I know that my natural, I'm a natural leader, as people say. Now, you may say I'm a natural leader. I might call myself controlling and I have to be in charge of everything, right? <laughs> I think that's the way my husband looks at it anyway. Um, but I knew I wasn't going to be somebody who took orders all the time. I was made to create the orders, you know? Yeah. So I moved up and actually what I did was, I joined uh, as a union, I became a union representative. Oh, really? Yes, that's how I start my first leadership. Well, I was always selected for some leadership role within the company, you know, lead mm -hmm. this group or lead this, uh, this, um, this initiative. But I wanted to really facilitate change. As you mentioned in my bio, I'm somebody who I'm a change maker. My sister calls me a rebel. Um, and, uh, in fact, my moniker is the, the results revolutionary because I'm all about changing it up and shaking things up. So I wanted to affect change and I decided that the union was the right way to go. So I actually became a vice president of the union. I was well-respected within the union. I was well-respected by the company because it was the company and the union. Right. And, um, Honestly, at some point, I realized that if I wanted to affect real change, doing it from the outside in was not the most effective approach, that I had to be in the inside 
to affect the change I wanted to. And it's so funny because when I told my boss, I said, can we talk about some management positions? He was like, I'm so glad you said that. I've been waiting for you to tell me that. You have such greater, great leadership skills. You're just a little skewed in your thinking. <laughs> like we need to make you think like a company person. Uh, so luckily, you know, they were like open arms. Come on, Trish, we want you to lead. Um, but what happened in the 90s, so I, I, I was with the company about 15 years. Okay. And what happened in the 1990s was there was a massive downsizing in all corporations. And the way that the... Uh, AT&T was the company that I worked for. And the way that they had to do their layoffs was very sad because unfortunately, many people do not like conflict. Because people mm -hmm. don't like conflict, conflict, many managers simply rated people as satisfactory or above satisfactory. So they couldn't look at results and say, oh, well, you're in the bottom, so you have to go because mm -hmm. everybody looked good. So they created a rating system that really created terrible results and people were laid off. I was very lucky. I was rated in the top tier, of course. I knew I would. I had lots of mentors, but lots of people were laid off. And it was very sad because People who thought they were doing great jobs all this time finally find out that, well, you're not really pulling your weight. I know you've been here 15 years, but sorry, you're the one that has to go. So not only did people have to leave, but they had to leave with the worst um, feeling. You know, oh, my gosh, I'm, I'm a piece of junk. Who knew? I didn't want to stay around the environment that was left. What was wow. left were people covering up, trying to hold their jobs, everybody being political. Most of my mentors, the people who respected me, the people who moved me up were gone. And I didn't like what was happening. I was not seen as a big fish anymore, truthfully. I mean, I became just a number. And it, when they moved people around in jobs, they just looked at what had I done before and they put me where they thought I wanted to go and it wasn't, so I left. It was and no that, longer a good fit and no it, longer the perfect job. No, it wasn't. It became quite the opposite. So when I left, and this happens for so many people, you know, you have this job where you're getting a paycheck every week and you're secure. Now, luckily for me, I was in sales. So I know how to sell. I know how to influence. I was also someone who was on the stage all the time with a microphone. So mm -hmm. I really developed my skills of influence. And everything that I've done since, I absolutely owe to that career. No question. But there I was uh, in the mid 90s, not sure what I wanted to do. So I tried a bunch of different things. And I think that's one of the things most of us don't do enough of. I, I really, I had the, my husband had a job, so money was coming in. They also gave me what was called at the time a golden parachute, like here, leave and here's some money. So they gave me lots of money to, to leave. They even paid my insurance, my health insurance for three years after I left. Wow. I know. So they really made it easy for me to get out of there. You don't and really hear about that happening these days. No, not anymore. Not anymore. But then it was uh, it was pretty much the norm. If you were a high level manager and I was at that point, a high level manager, they gave us a nice amount of money to go. And uh, I read a book. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I don't know what's going on with my lighting. Sorry about that. Um, but I read a book and it was called You Can Do Anything You Want if you only knew what it was. That's a great title. <laughs> it's a great title. And it was a great book. And what she recommended was while you can, I mean, even if, and this is advice for everybody, even if you're working, dabble in the things you think you want to do if you want to break out on your own. So I did radio commercials. I had friends who were in radio, so I was able to do radio commercials. I thought I wanted to do voiceover acting. Okay. Uh, right. I love animals, so I wanted to work with animals. So I volunteered at a shelter and found I didn't want to work with animals because I don't want to clean out cages. I don't want to deal with barking dogs. I, I love them, but I don't want to take care of them like that. 
Um, I volunteered at the museum because I love history and I love those. I just did all the things I loved. And I lucked out. I really lucked out. I'm, I am surrounded by people. And I think that the biggest thing that I can suggest to anyone who wants to do their own thing, start their own business, be a single shingle, as my friend Charlie calls it, um, is to be surrounded by people who support you, know you, love you, care about you, and understand you. Your people trial. who are people who are going to say, "You go for it, girl. You can do this, girl." Not people who are going to see you fall and say, "Oh, maybe you should go back and get a job again." So that may not be family, right? A lot of times, it's not family. A lot of times, it's people who are, you know, you really want to find the people who are doing what you're doing. You mm -hmm. want to be, you, you know, if you're if you're someone, and this is something that happened to me. Once I started doing my own thing, if you will, and what I did was I trained at corporations. I was a trainer for corporations. I would go in and do all kinds of different types of training, technical training, as well as sales training, um, as well as uh, what they call soft skills training. It's now called EQ or uh, intelligence quotient. Oh, you know, yeah. How to deal with people, how to manage difficult conversations, how to move people to be productive. So that's the first thing I did. But it, the, um, the biggest thing is that no matter what, I always had people who had my back and who understood me and who never said you should get a job. And what I find is that, like me, when I first started doing my own thing, my friends were my old friends, my friends from my job. Mm -hmm. My friends who thought that the nirvana is having a paycheck for the rest of your life and working for a company that can tell you to do whatever they want you to do whenever they want you to do it. And they don't, they don't get it. It's not that they don't love you. It's simply they don't understand the thinking it takes to be an entrepreneur, to be on your own, to be responsible for your own income. Because so they they've would, never been there. Right. A lot of times anyway. Right. You know, you think about there's that uh, that old story about the crabs in the in the crab pot mm -hmm. and all the crabs are at the bottom and one of them tries to climb out. And literally the other crabs will jump and pull that crab back down. Right. And it's not that they don't care about you. It's just that they think they're doing the best that it is for you. So surrounding yourself with like-minded and more importantly, like-spirited people is the number one suggestion I have for people. So I did a lot of different things. I trained at corporate and then I got sick of that because I felt like I was doing what I was doing before. Then I uh, got into real estate investing. I was Ooh, so was lucky. That fun? Oh my gosh. I had such a great time. I had a mentor who uh, he invited me simply to help him with the leads. So I would go meet the homeowner. I would talk to the homeowner. I would connect them with him and he would close the deal. And I would get a piece of that. Like I would get, I'd get paid just for bringing him in. Then I get a percentage on whatever uh, the foreclosure or the, sometimes it was a probate. I would get a piece of that. So I, again, because of the people in my life, because I was surrounded by people, because I know relationships are everything, I had people that I could go to who offered me positions. You know, the first thing is you have to shine. You have to be somebody who shows up. You have to be somebody who is um, there to serve other people. And they will think of you first when it's time. So I was invited to do that. And it was fun, fun, fun until the bubble burst back in 2008. In 2008, oh. we all went into a recession. You remember, right? Yes, I do remember. When was you, you also were unhappy in your job. When was that, that you left your job? Um, you know, I couldn't tell you what year it was. It, well, if you're quick on math, it was about 17, 18 years ago or so. Yeah, so that was the beginning of the 2000s. Yeah. So, you know, it was, uh, it was time for me. My daughter was just getting into um, first grade. And, and I knew she was going to be one of these sports extra, extracurricular activity kind of gals. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted to be able to attend everything 
without asking permission. That was one big driving point. Yeah, but it's scary, isn't it? Like when you give up that paycheck that you're getting every week? Oh, yes, yes, it's very scary. Um, when I did my big leap, it was, uh, I did have an, another person that was paying the bills. And about three months after I quit my job and went 100% self-employed, you know, it was with the idea of having extra money for vacations and our, and our retirements and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, well, he lost his job mm -hmm. uh, and never did really get another paying the bills kind of job. So uh, I had to quickly pivot. <laughs> That's a big word these days. Yes. Um, quickly pivot into being the person that paid all the bills. Um, so it was a big leap of faith and very scary. Yeah, I know the feeling. I got divorced uh, during this time that I was um, spreading my entrepreneurial wings. So same thing for me. It was a little scary because even though his income was not where anywhere near what mine was when I was in corporate, um, it was still, I know it was steady money. Right. But, but I got divorced because it was the right thing for me. I made the choice. I mm -hmm. knew that that was something that I had to do. And that was part of the impetus of us creating Women's Prosperity Network in 2008. Because, really? yes, because in 2008, when the recession hit, many people that I knew that were in jobs were no longer in jobs. Just right. like yes. now with the pandemic and what happened to people, they got laid off. And I saw so many women who wanted to do something on their own, like the hairdresser who wants to start her own business, knows a lot about cutting hair, but doesn't have a clue how to run a business, right? There are two oh, yes. different skill sets. Even I, when I came out of corporate, even though I had, I ran my organization as a profit and loss center. So I watched numbers, I paid attention, I looked at the data, I was projecting and forecasting and doing all those things that you do in business. I didn't have all the skills to be a business person either. Um, but there were a lot of women who wanted, a lot of women around me who wanted to do different things. And I also had friends who were burnt out in their jobs, nurses in particular, mm -hmm. burnt out in their jobs and in corporate burnt out. Um, but the first thing they thought of was, let me go get another job. So I was like, no, you don't have to do that. The other issue that I ran into about my divorce was I had, I had money in the bank. I knew how to earn money. Worst case, I could get a job because I had networked enough. Mm -hmm. But how many women did I know at that time? I was in my mid 40s. And how many women I knew who did not have my choice, that they had to stay in an unhappy marriage they had to stay feeling less than, they had to stay they because were they didn't have, exactly. So there were two things going on. So for women's, in 08, we just, what happened was I didn't like going networking. I really didn't. It had such a yucky uh, feeling for me. I would, I'm not shy. I was going to say, and you're great with people. Thank you. I could walk into a room and I could meet people and I could make friends, but I didn't like it. I didn't like when I said to someone, hi, I'm Trish Carr. And I put my hand out. I said, and you are. And instead of speaking to me, they would take their business card and hand me their business card. I'm like, why don't you talk to me? I right? hate that. I, I, me too. And I would walk into a room and there would be a little group of four over here and a little group of three over here. And, a, and I said, you know, if this is a challenge for me, what's it like for every other woman who doesn't even have nearly the confidence that I have, right? Yeah. So I wanted Thinking to into those clicks was really hard when I was trying to do it. Yeah. It's like, how do you weasel your way in without feeling pushy? Right. Because mm -hmm. that's the last thing we want to feel. And then the other thing was the way I saw people selling. It was a very male energy. You know, it, it, I felt like everybody I talked to all I, they wanted to be an infomercial. Huh. So I wanted to create a networking that was comfortable, that felt good, that was warm, that was inviting. And I wanted to show 
other women in particular, because that's really my, where my whole life I've been moving the needle forward for women's equality. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show women that you can have a business. You can take what you love doing and turn it into your income. So, and I also wanted the women who were stuck in relationships to have options. So it was all of that coming together. And lucky for me, I have two amazing sisters, blood sisters, who also wanted to do that with me. So we teamed together to create it. And I have to tell you that having partners makes things a lot easier. You know, you can share the, the, the work, you can share the challenges, you can share the joy. I and don't, the skill sets. Absolutely. And we all bring great skills to the table and we fill in each other where, you know, where I don't have something, my sister Susan Winner will have it. If, if Susan doesn't have it, my sister Nancy Matthews will have it. So I really think creating relationships and partnering with people is a great way to create something. And here's the thing. It doesn't have to be your sister. It could be a friend. It could be someone you admire, someone you know, someone you, you know will be there for you. And you can always find common ground to create whatever it is you want to create. So that's kind of how it all happened in a 20-minute nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> well, a couple of things came to mind as you were talking. Um, and I'll bring up the, the, the last one that came to mind first. You were talking about partnering up with people. And I know in the past when I personally have tried to partner up with somebody just on one little project, not yeah. something big like a business, things would fall apart very quickly. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, it was generally maybe the expectations weren't clearly laid out or, or something. So what advice do you have along the lines of actually making a partnership work or, or even choosing the right type of person to partner with in the beginning. You, you, you know what I mean? Yes, absolutely. I know exactly what you mean. Um, one of the, there's a lot of things to do. You were right. Expectations is the biggest thing. Most of the time we go into it, we're very excited about it. Everybody's on board. And then we hit a, a hiccup. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing is you've got to have in writing, who's doing what, who's responsible for what, right down to the generation of revenue. Because if one person is doing all the revenue generation, the others are going to feel bad that they're not doing it. And the person who's doing the revenue generation is going to be resentful of them because they're not doing it. So right. it's really about having setting, like you said, Dottie, you're right. It's about getting the expectations of who's doing what, what are you responsible for? What's your accountability, right? Are we gonna, mm -hmm. we're gonna get together every Monday, Wednesday and Friday and check in with each other? What's happening? What's, what's going on? How are we doing? What could I do better? And then the, the intangible, but it is very tangible, is that we like to say we have a 10 relationship. So on a scale of one to 10, our relationship is a 10. Okay. individually and together. And what that means is that if we have a conflict, we handle it right then and there. We speak our mind with tact and love. We don't make up stories about what we think somebody might be doing or not doing. We ask and we communicate. And I know that communication is the answer to everything. But some people don't even get what communication is. Communication is you see something, you say something. Not you yeah. see something, you think about it, you wonder, you get more excited about it. And then finally, when you talk about it, you're exploding. That's not what it is. <laughs> and how you handle those things are also agreements that you have in the beginning. So, so you have that example, all right now. Yes, as much as you can, as much as you can. Even, you know, at Women's Prosperity Network, when we first started, we were just about, we wanted to create networking and masterminding, a way for women to share best practices for networking, but we have grown into a full-fledged education, mentoring. We have 
all of the tools that you need to be successful in business. Mm -hmm. And if we, we personally don't, we have, we have a network of people that we can refer you to like you, Dottie, who can do a bang up job on your SEO, your websites, and making sure that everything's working. Yep. So the, the uh, and that's, that's really key is that you have really great partners, not just who you work with and you have mm-hmm. agreements with, but partners that make other differences that you can't make. Strategic partners. Correct. And that also helped us grow. But, you know, the thing is that no matter where you are, if you're thinking you want to start your business or you're in a business and you want to know how to make it grow, I invite you to connect with Women's Prosperity because that's what we're about. We show you how to create partnerships, how to create strategic partnerships for small projects and big projects, how to create affiliates, people who are love what you do so much that they're singing your praises and helping you fill um, your client list. Yes. That's I am the- very happy that I joined Women's Prosperity Network. Um, it's been a great year uh, and a half or however long it's been, um, you know, as far as growing my business. And whenever I've got a question, you guys seem to have the answer. Well, and I don't have to know all the answers because I can find somebody who does. And that's key. You don't have to have all the answers. And that's something that holds us back from starting our own businesses. We feel like, well, what are people going to learn from me? Remember that a five-year-old can teach a three-year-old how to tie their shoes. You don't have to know everything. You just have to know a little bit more of the people in front of the people that you're, you're working with. So starting your business is about trying trial and error. And the more you make mistakes you make, the better you get because you learn on every mistake. And one of the biggest things is to really expand your, what we call your, um, your network, the people that you know, your connections, your resources. And that happens by networking and networking happens in a lot of ways. When you go Mm -hmm. to a workshop, you're networking with the people there. When you are out in the grocery store, you can meet people. I mean, there's places that you can go. And then there's really traditional networking. So one of the things we do, especially now in this age of virtual networking, where people are doing it on Zoom and on other platforms, there's really a nuance to being able to effectively network. Mm -hmm. So I actually have a gift for everybody on how to network and maximize your virtual connections because connections are everything. So you can go to women's, that's E-N-S, womensprosperitynetwork.com and then slash virtual. And there you'll see how do you maximize your virtual networking? Because yeah, you want to be with the right people. And you're not always going to make it the first time. Like we've worked with partners that we thought were the right partners and it didn't work out, Mm -hmm. but we learned along the way. And I can attest to that too. (laughs) Right. Haven't you? We've had people that it fell apart. Okay. It fell apart. What can we do differently next time? Yep. It's all a learning curve. Mm -hmm. Um, So I will put that link in the comments after or under the live video after we're done here. Great. And, I just wanted to affirm what you were saying about you don't have to know everything. When I first started my business, um, I actually started before social media was a big thing. It was back. Oh, I don't know when MySpace was out there. So a long time ago. Yeah. And and I was one of these people. Social media. What's that? Why do I got to do blah, blah, blah? Like I hear people saying now. My thought was, if I'm two weeks ahead of the person I'm teaching, I'm golden. Yep. That's and exactly so right. I, that, and that's what I did. I stayed, I learned and I did little trainings on how to do something and create a following from people that were two weeks behind where I was. Yep. That's all you need to do. That's well, the this other has thing. been a fabulous conversation. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you many, so much. Many pearls of wisdom in there. Uh, And for next week, we will be um, visiting with Terry Lynn Phillips. So that will be super exciting as well. I just saw her. Yep. I hope all of you guys 
are again halfway to your weekly goal so we can celebrate hello hump day next wednesday as well and have a fabulous day bye thank you bye bye everybody